Well, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Today, Commissioner Pichek will present our latest data and modeling, which will show continued low prevalence of COVID-19 here in Vermont. As Dr. Fauci said on Tuesday, Vermont is a model for the country on how to suppress this virus. You should all be very proud of your hard work to keep each other safe. It's put us in a position where we've been able to methodically reopen the economy. And we've had kids back in schools for, for two weeks now. And we also have had college students back in Vermont for a month. But as Dr. Fauci also said, we can't let our guard down. We must continue to do, do the things that got us here, like wearing a mask, staying physically distant, washing our hands, staying home when sick, and being smart with gathering size and travel. I will continue to echo Dr. Fauci's call to remain vigilant. We don't look to, need to look any further than the sad milestone we're approaching here in the U.S. with nearly 200,000 deaths due to this virus. The Northeast was hit particularly hard with about 65,000 of those. In Vermont, thankfully, we've not reached the death rates of other states but we've sadly lost 58 Vermonters. And we'll honor them tomorrow on the 19th as we have each month since April. Again, I only say this as a reminder of why we've taken the steps we have and why we've got to remain vigilant. Our collective good work to date has let us open just about every sector to some extent. And we've been able to steadily move forward, not back. On Tuesday, Dr. Fauci emphasized that our least low case prevalence is why we've been able to do this, saying, when you have a test positivity of two tenths of one percent, you are starting with the game on your side. So as we continue to see low, low case counts, and as we've learned from our experience with lodging and indoor dining over the last few months, we're updating our guidance. Effective today, with physical distancing requirements in place, bar seating in restaurants will be allowed, meaning food and drink service can take place at the counter if the restaurant has one, but there needs to be a minimum of six feet between parties, an Alexan barrier between the customers and the staff behind the counter. As well, we're allow allowing lodging facilities to rent all their rooms as long as guests comply with all other requirements. The mask, physical distancing, and our travel and quarantine requirements are still in place, as are limits on dining and gathering size. I know some may worry about whether this means we'll see a flood of people from other states, so I want to remind everyone that our campgrounds, marinas, and cottages, which are now closing for the season, have been at 100% capacity all summer. And Commissioner Pichek will share some data on the level of travel we've seen, which is down significantly from 2019. As well, as a reminder, we have a travel policy in place, and the lodging industry has been doing a very good job helping us to enforce it. This policy allows people from counties that are, are like Vermont with low rates of the virus to come without quarantine but all others must, must uh, continue to quarantine if they're coming into the state. So while we look forward to welcoming all who are following those travel policies, if you're from a county in the red or yellow, please follow the quarantine guidance or stay home. To help make it easier for travelers to comply and lodging facilities to help them do so, we're also moving our travel map update and modeling presentations to Tuesdays. This will give folks a few more days to see the latest map and adjust their travel plans to comply. Now, we're entering fall foliage, so we will be seeing more visitors. But as Dr. Fauci said, we're starting from a really good place. And if we do all do our part, both for monitors and visitors, we can continue to safely open up the economy put people back to work in order to provide for their families and prevent our local small businesses from closing their doors for good. 
We can take these steps forward and continue to see low, low case counts. We've proven that since late April when we first began reopening. Again, by turning the spigot a quarter turn at a time, we've been able to reopen and do so safely and will continue to take this approach. I also want to be clear, I know this is not enough to soften the economic blow to our hospitality sector. And we're continuing to work with the legislature to support these businesses that were hit the hardest in order to help save the jobs and revenues they create. So in other news, I'm pleased to announce we've launched another initiative to support small businesses today. We now have five organizations across the state offering new technical assistance programs which provide free expert advice on how businesses can navigate this pandemic. From all small businesses and nonprofits interested in learning more or want help should visit accd.vermont.gov. And Secretary Curley is here to answer any questions you may have. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Levine to talk a little bit more about these changes as well as provide an update on the cases at two local schools. Good morning. <clears throat> I want to begin by recognizing that September is Public Health Lab Appreciation Month. These incredibly hardworking Vermonters put in the long hours, many working without a day off for many weeks or months at a time, to process, analyze, and report out on the test samples taken from, so far, more than 153,000 people in the state. And they do this within days, sometimes hours, of receiving the samples. Work that is meticulous and must be performed to existing and exacting specifications. So to everyone associated with our public health lab, the people who put the tests together for distribution, the lab techs, our tireless lab leadership, the microbiologists, and many others who work to support this tremendous effort you have not just my thanks, but the appreciation of every Vermonter whose health and well-being you work to protect around the clock. <clears throat> and speaking of those test results, you'll hear more extensively from Commissioner Pichak this morning, but our total case count in Vermont is up to 1,706, with two being added last night. We remain at a total number of deaths of 58, with no deaths in the last 51 days. And as of this morning, there were two patients hospitalized with COVID in the state. And if I heard it correctly, none uh, under investigation. I don't have much to add relating to the few cases reported in the two schools that we've discussed previously except to say that many members of the Crossett Brook Middle School community were tested at a health department pop-up on Wednesday. The good news is that thus far, all tests have been negative. Anyone identified as a close contact is of course quarantined. I'm happy to announce that on the, on the Vermont Department of Health COVID-19 website, you can now link to a school-based COVID-19 uh, transmission table of current, recovered, and total cases. As the governor stated, on Tuesday we had the honor of hearing directly from Dr. Fauci, someone who history, history will record as one of the great public health heroes of this pandemic. It was a moment for me to pause and take pride in our collective efforts. Vermont continues to have the lowest percentage of test positivity and rate of new cases in the country. And to par paraphrase Dr. Fauci, our successes thus far have been a matter of what we did or did not do correctly. And I agree when he said that from the numbers he's seen, Vermont has done it correctly. This is why we can continue to open carefully including the governor's announcement today regarding lodging capacity expansion. 
People staying in these facilities are safely limited to their own space, just like they would be at home. Gathering spaces within these establishments will still be restricted to prevent crowding. The key here, whether we're talking about a lodging establishment or a bar, is to pre prevent milling around, prevent a breakdown in social distancing, and prevent crowding. But while Dr. Fauci praised our prudent reopening, he also noted our good work cannot allow us to become complacent. With changes in the season and the onset of colder weather, we will be moving indoors, and that will have an impact on our cases. We have to prepare for keeping each other safe, both in the fall and the winter. We'll be living and breathing closer together for longer periods of time, sharing space and germs, exactly the environment in which COVID-19 thrives. This makes it imperative that we keep up our core prevention practices to avoid illness. One thing we have learned is that most of the time, people aren't going to work or school or to gatherings when they have symptoms. And yet the virus can still spread. This means people are out in their communities carrying the virus when they don't have symptoms and don't yet know it. There's no better reminder than this to keep us to continue wearing our masks, keeping a distance from others, and limiting riskier activities like social gatherings indoors. I want to close by thanking the schools and the district administrators, who are the experts on their operations, to know they have our support when they have to make hard decisions, such as moving to remote learning, so that when there are cases, they have time to get a handle on the situation and to make sure that their students, staff, and teachers who may be affected can be contacted and appropriate steps for their health and isolation taken. So let's keep up the good work and keep Vermont the national model for staying healthy and open that Dr. Fauci said we are. Now I'll turn it over to Commissioner Peach. Uh, thank you, Dr. Levine, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, this morning, we'll start with an overview uh, of the national data over the last uh, couple of weeks, and then turn to Vermont specific data uh, before giving a K through 12 and higher education update, uh, and then closing with a regional data and travel map update. So turning first to the national data, you can see uh, over the past 10 days or so, uh, a dip down in cases, followed by a spike back up in cases. Um, we're watching this closely uh, across our region and across the country. Uh, it's attributable largely to four things. We don't know how much or to what degree, but the fact that over Labor Day there was a slowdown in testing in some places. There was also potentially an increase in transmission based on people's behavior over Labor Day. And then, of course, like in Vermont, the rest of the country is opening up uh, K through 12 uh, and higher education institutions as well. So we'll continue to watch that closely and see um, if that uh, develops into a, a national trend. Uh, but the good news is that the hospitalization rates across the country continue to go down um, and the death rate, although too high, continues to level out um, over the past few weeks. If you look at the regional data, uh, the census data, you can see that no particular area of the country uh, really stands out. Actually, all census areas appear to be going up uh, slightly after Labor Day. Again, one might think that's attributable to uh, all of those areas having a slowdown potentially in testing uh, over the Labor Day weekend uh, or based on activity over Labor Day weekend. So we'll keep a close eye on that, like I said, but uh, we are seeing uh, increased cases in basically every census region uh, across the country. Turning now to the map that shows uh, the prevalence of the virus uh, on a per capita basis across the country, uh, we expanded this out to a 30-day period. You can now see really uh, the entire uh, time when colleges were restarting across the country, when K through 12 was restarting across the country. And as Dr. Fauci reiterated uh, when he was here on Tuesday, uh, you can see really that um, the numbers are on Vermont's side. You can see how low the prevalence of the virus is in the Northeast 
particularly in Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine, um, and how that's really helped us uh, be in a position to successfully reopen uh, K through 12 uh, and higher education as well. Um, we'll point out a few other uh, states that opened up higher education in a minute uh, that were from a higher prevalence area and show you what the results were uh, in those locations. Turning to our Vermont data, you can see we increased our cases this week by uh, 46, uh, up from the pretty low week last week of 29, uh, but we continue to maintain that lowest positivity rate uh, in the country, uh, the lowest per capita prevalence since the start of the pandemic, and then the lowest uh, prevalence over the last seven days as well. So all of those top line metrics are very much in Vermont's favor uh, still to date. Turning to our forecast, you'll see uh, that we have a um, pretty similar forecast from last week. Uh, we are anticipating maybe a tick up of one or two cases uh, as we get to later September uh, into October. Again, now this forecast in incorporates all of the increased mobility from K through 12, from higher ed, from parents returning to work potentially, from parents being more mobile themselves as their children are in school. Uh, and our case trends as well. So that's all being picked up in the model. Uh, and again, uh, even with uh, a projected increase, uh, we, uh, it's not giving us concern based on uh, the level of that increase. It's something within the capacity of the health department to continue to do their good work in contact tracing. Uh, so that um, we'll continue to look at closely, but uh, that is a, a rather favorable uh, forecast at this point. Turning to our four restart metrics, we'll just highlight these very briefly. They all are in a good spot. Syndromic surveillance continues to be very low. The viral growth rate continues to be very low. And our positivity rate, as we mentioned, continues to be the best uh, in the country. In terms of hospital capacity, uh, we still have plenty of ICU space and uh, traditional hospital bed space as well. And as Dr. Levine said, only two people uh, in the hospital uh, as of today, which is certainly good news. Turning to a K through 12 and higher education update, uh, I first want to show northern New England and the cases that have been reported across Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine. Uh, as you can see here in Vermont, uh, we've reported three cases in two different schools. Uh, Maine, uh, pretty close to Vermont, with about six cases, uh, and then uh, those impacting four different uh, institutions. Uh, and New Hampshire currently reporting 23 cases through their K-12 through system, uh, impacting 14 different schools. Uh, so again, all pretty much in a similar position, Vermont, um, on the better end of those results as of now, uh, but something that we're going to continue to look very closely at both in Vermont and across the region to, uh, to assess how K through 12 uh, reopening is going. Turning to the college data, you see that we conducted over 12,000 tests here in Vermont uh, for uh, higher education institutions this week. Uh, and turning to our cumulative numbers, you see that that's now 54,000, close to 55,000 tests since the start of the college uh, reopening um, for 42 positive tests in total, so very low positivity rate. Uh, so that's something certainly uh, that we should be um, very proud of uh, as we continue to progress along the fall semester. We also are providing the individual college data as well by test and positivity number. I should note that uh, Almost all of the colleges have public dashboards or public information. They've done a very good job of um, communicating with their communities and with us as a state uh, about uh, where they stand in terms of their reopening. Uh, but now we will have a link on our website that has all of those um, dashboards easily accessible, as well as uh, weekly an update on each of the institutions as well. Uh, so I encourage anyone that's interested in looking at more data to go either to our presentation uh, or to our website to find those public links. Uh, turning now to a national analysis, we'll go through this very briefly, but uh, we wanted to demonstrate what Dr. Levine has been talking about and what Dr. Fauci has been talking about with taking a sample of nine states, the three states here in New England, Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine that have the lowest prevalence in the country, and then looking at three states that have more of an average prevalence, uh, and then looking at three states that are really on the other end of that spectrum. They've had the highest case counts uh, for the last 30 days, so that period of time when they were opening up their higher education uh, institutions. You can see Vermont averaging about 47 cases per 100,000, Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine, that is. Uh, you can see eight, uh, 381 across those three middle prevalence states, and then uh, 786 across those higher prevalent states. 
So when we look and see what the results have been to date in terms of college reopening, again, we see Vermont. Uh, we heard data on Vermont, but New Hampshire and Maine are similarly having very successful reopenings. When you combine our positivity rates across the region, we're at 0 0.10, a very low positivity rate. Um, New Hampshire has the most cases in higher ed. They added about 30 this week, many of them attributable to the New University of New Hampshire. Uh, but still, they, Maine and Vermont, doing very well and are reopening. When you look at those middle states, North Carolina, Indiana, and Virginia, again, when you look at their total number, they're really quite larger than Vermont. But when you look at their positivity rate, similarly, significantly higher than we're experiencing here in Vermont and New England with an average of 2.94%. Not necessarily uh, concerningly high, but certainly not as good as we're seeing uh, here uh, in the Northeast. And then last, when we look at those high prevalence states, Again, you can see their case counts are quite high. And then when you look at their positivity rate, uh, over just over 6% in terms of the positivity rate. So much higher uh, in those high prevalence states in terms of what they're seeing on campus. Um, and that just proves the point or shows the point, again, that Dr. Levine and Dr. Fauci have been talking about. Low prevalence areas, you're much more likely to be successful in reopening your schools or reopening your economy uh, as well. And again, here's the national map just identifying where those states were that we pulled from and that visualization of what the infection rates were during the last 30 days. So you can see North Dakota, Iowa, Alabama, much higher infection rates uh, than Indiana, Virginia, and uh, North Carolina, and then the Northeast having considerably lower infection rates over the last 30 days. Uh, turning to the regional data, just a quick update here. We did see an increase in new cases across the region, up 25% to uh, about 12,000. Uh, new cases this week. That's the first time we've been over 12,000 since the beginning part of June. Um, when we look at the individual uh, states and, and also Quebec, we do see that there are cases tied to higher ed reopening. There are cases tied to K through 12 reopening. Um, so it's something we're going to look at closely. Uh, testing is also up across the region broadly. Uh, so something we're going to look at closely uh, and continue to monitor. Uh, but at this point, nothing in particular stands out to us. And still, the amount of cases that we're seeing in the region much lower than cases that they're seeing across the rest of the country. Flipping ahead to our travel map update, again, I uh, just want to very briefly point out, as the governor said, uh, we wanted to show data about the 2019 uh, in-state tourism business compared to the 2020 in-state tourism business. This map here shows that difference between 2019 and 2020, all out-of-state visitors into Vermont. Uh, you can see that the numbers are down uh, quite significantly. And when you look at 2019, you can see that the next four or five weeks are really the last opportunity for the tourism industry until it drops off uh, quite a bit uh, in late October and November before ski season picks back up. So this is a good opportunity for them uh, to uh, get increased occupancy in their establishments uh, and hopefully uh, make some economic gains while doing that safely. When we look and talk about doing it safely, and the governor mentioned this as well, crediting the lodging establishments and individuals as well for not coming to Vermont when they're in a place that has a high case count. Uh, this is mobility data showing uh, a period of time from uh, just after uh, 4th of July through the beginning part of August, and looking at counties that were always green during that period of time. And you can see there is a reduction in travel year over year, uh, but it's relatively slight. Uh, at worst, it's around 15 uh, to 20 percent. Uh, but then we did the same thing on counties that were never green during that same six-week period of time. And you can see that the reduction in travel from this year compared to last year was significantly higher. So that, again, tells us that uh, people are following our quarantine uh, requirements, that lodging establishments are enforcing them. Uh, and again, you know, Vermonters themselves are following them when they travel uh, out of state as well. Uh, lastly, before doing the map update, uh, just a little bit more specificity. We were talking about all out-of-state visitors. Now looking at out-of-state visitors to lodging establishments, you can see 2018, 2019 quite similar uh, year over year, but 2020 down significantly. So the lodging industry really hit hard uh, as a result of the pandemic, which I think all of us uh, are familiar with. And they are making gains throughout the summer, but um, still down considerably from previous years. And like I said, when looking at uh, travel uh, from out of state to those green counties that have always been green uh, to lodging establishments, down about 50%, but from those places that were always red, down over 75%. Uh, 
uh, again, giving us a good data uh, indicator that the lodging establishments are enforcing the quarantine and, and uh, out-of-staters are following it as well. Getting now to the updated travel map, uh, you'll see uh, here, uh, both on the update and if we slip ahead a slide on the comparison of where places uh, turned, uh, that we did open up a number of counties this week. Last week, 5.5 million people could come to Vermont without a quarantine. This week, it's 7.4 million. So even though the region did see cases go up, the number of people that are eligible to travel to Vermont without a quarantine went up by about uh, 2 million uh, cases. That's because a number of high population counties uh, did see cases decrease. Uh, a number of them are right at that 400 threshold, uh, but they did decrease and they're eligible to come to Vermont uh, without a quarantine, particularly some of the counties in New Jersey, uh, New York, uh, and Connecticut, as well as uh, New Hampshire as well. Their most populous counties all uh, flipped to green. So with that, I'll just remind everyone, as the governor said, that uh, we will uh, provide an update uh, on the travel map uh, on Tuesday and do that on Tuesday uh, every week going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Pichak. Always very interesting data. Now, before we go into uh, today's uh, questions, we um, had a question on Tuesday from Steve in the Northeast Kingdom that challenged the credibility of our beloved Vermont treat, the creamy. So um, we couldn't let it um, go. Um, we needed to, uh, to make sure that uh, in the minds of uh, Vermonters, there was no doubt uh, that creamies are a dairy product. So uh, I've asked Secretary Tebbets uh, to make it clear. He's on the line now, and he's done a little bit of research this week. Uh, maybe you could fill us in. Well, uh, thank you, Governor, and good morning, all. Uh, I'd like to talk about uh, the creamery, or in uh, some regions it's called uh, soft serve. Uh, but where we stand, it is the cream. Headline, it's dairy. Uh, there is cream in creamy. Now, creamies, uh, they can come in many flavors. There's uh, vanilla, chocolate, maybe black cherry, and perhaps uh, the most iconic one is the maple creamy uh, made with Vermont maple syrup. You can even get a swirl of maple and vanilla, and the combinations are endless. So how is a creamy made? Well, it starts with Vermont dairy. Our extensive modeling shows Vermont creamies are made with a base of milk, cream, sugar, and natural stabilizers. Again, not too complicated, milk, sugar, cream. At this point, I would ask Dr. Levine, he might want to uh, look away. Uh, the next uh, statistic may uh, make the docs cringe a little bit. A high butter fat content is needed to reach the desired consistency. Most creamies are made with a six to seven percent butter fat. That's why it's smooth and creamy and good. Dairy plants can make the mix. For example, uh, Kingdom Creamery in Caledonia County, the milk from the uh, Michaud cows in Hardwick is made into a creamy mix and it's distributed throughout Vermont um, and the Northeast. So where can I get a creamy? Well, just about everywhere in Vermont, they are essential. There are more than 670 frozen dessert licenses on file here at the Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets. Creamies can be found in just about every corner of Vermont, from Vernon to Berkshire, from Burlington to Bennington to Brattleboro and beyond. You'll find them in Vermont's villages, the downtowns, hills, mountains, and valleys providing us comfort during this pandemic. And you can have confidence a Vermont creamy is made with cream from Vermont cows. Creamies run in Vermonters veins. Thank you, Governor. Well, thank you very much, Secretary Tebbis. That'll put everyone at ease, I'm sure, uh, <laughs> after last week. Uh, so with that, we'll open up for questions. Calvin? Uh, thank you, Governor. This might be for Secretary Curley. So you mentioned that we are launching this new way that businesses can, can find answers. I'm wondering what sort of questions they'd be answering, who will be answering these questions, and, and uh, if there's not more financial help on the way, what, what this best to accomplish? 
Yeah, so, you know, early on we, we understood that employers were going to have to be nimble and arguably change the way they do business. And they were expressing interest in having technical assistance. And it might be for creating more of an online presence, for example. It might be the layout in a restaurant. It might be um, just navigating what our environment is right now and what our current guidance provides and, and requires them to do. So it's a group of folks um, who responded to an RFP that we put out and uh, or a, a variety of organizations. I am happy to say that all five of them were excellent. And what they brought to the table was the ability to serve broadly around Vermont um, in all regions, but definitely some expertise in a variety of sectors as well. So we chose to fund all five. And so um, I have great confidence that, that these employers, these businesses that need help reimagining how they will deliver a service or create a product, uh, product now will also carry in, you know, once we are, once this is in our rearview mirror, hopefully they will have um, made an adjustment that will enable them to be once again nimble if we do hit another um, uh, setback like, like we have experienced. Um, at any rate, uh, it's a free service to employers, I just want to mention, and there's more information, as the governor mentioned earlier, it's on our website at ACCD. Dot, uh, gov, and um, we're happy to help answer questions. Thank you. And then, um, Governor, just a quick follow-up. So the uh, federal judge uh, threw out the uh, GOP lawsuit against the mail-in voting plan. I'm just hoping to gather your thoughts. You said earlier this week that it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. I'm just hoping to gather your thoughts on it. Yeah, well, first of all, um, just to clarify, it wasn't a GOP, I don't believe, uh, lawsuit. It just happened to be filed by um, Republicans. So I don't think it was a, an effort by the state party. Um, but again, uh, you know, we need to move forward. Um, the election is, is uh, not too far away. Um, we want to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to exercise their right to vote. So this makes it clear uh, that uh, we'll continue, uh, the Secretary of State will continue to mail ballots and, and put those into place. So. Uh, at this point in time, it's in his hands. Uh, he has uh, uh, maintained uh, confidence that this can be done safely and effectively, uh, and so uh, we'll rely on him at this point. David? Um, this week, well, yesterday, the House voted to override um, your veto of the uh, global warming bill. I'm wondering, you know, what your concerns or thoughts are for the state going forward. Um, and also, you know, is, do you hear a message or anything like that you take from it? Well, again, it wasn't surprising um, from my standpoint that the House decided to override the veto. It still has uh, to go through the Senate. It's not over at this point. Uh, they have to, to, to do so as well. Uh, so they'll be doing, as I understand it, uh, they'll be doing it next week. Uh, you know, my. I, I think I've, I've tried to be clear on this. Um, I don't, uh, I believe climate change is real. Uh, I believe that we do have to take steps. We've been taking a number of steps over the last uh, few years, but there are, you know, there are technical problems with the bill itself, a uh, constitutional question uh, that I believe, uh, and, and my, uh, my general counsel and others believe is, uh, is, is concerning uh, in a lot of respects and, and will be, you know, have an effect on what, how we do things in the future. Abdicating uh, your position or your authority uh, is something that um, is unconstitutional when you do it across lines. So uh, when I say that, um, you know, I think some are looking at the wrong question. When I question the constitutionality, um, the legislature can abdicate their authority, but they can't abdicate the governor's authority. So there is no mechanism there for the governor to okay whatever they put forward. So they have this 23 member board, 15 of their members uh, are their picks. So they can have anything they want go through uh, and, then, uh, and then it becomes, becomes law uh, in, in, in effect. So I still have concerns about this. Um, I'm hoping uh, the, the Senate will see the wisdom in trying to take a step back, address the, the concerns that I laid out weeks ago um, and the uh, legislature ignored, and uh, then move together, uh, move forward together. Um, because I still believe uh, that we need to address climate change. We can do it with the, uh, some of the provisions they have in the bill. 
but uh, the technical aspects are the problem. Sure, and some of those concerns, the constitutionality concerns and the possibility, it sounds like, of unelected officials to create law in the state. Do you think there's room there, even if the Senate does vote to override, to continue to fight this bill? Well, somebody will, I would, I would assume, somebody is going to question the constitutionality of the bill, which, again, I think they're on firm ground in doing so. So we'll see. And then, uh, you know, let's, let's not forget uh, some of the timelines they put into place within the bill are going to be uh, difficult to achieve. Um, and, um, and I feel as though uh, the legislature just wiped their hands clean of that because they didn't want to make the, the tough decisions that will need to be made over the next four years. And uh, this unelected, uh, unaccountable board will be making these decisions. So, um, you know, again, let's, uh, let's not forget uh, this is going to be very difficult and very problematic uh, for Vermonters. And, and without that accountability, without the oversight, without the okay from the legislature, this plan should go back to the legislature and be approved. And then it should have some oversight from the governor to make sure uh, that it's the right approach for Vermont. But um, we'll see what the, what the Senate does uh, this week. Gotcha. And um, lastly, uh, regarding um, hospitality, uh, hotels, restaurants, that sort of thing, um, I know this has been desperately trying to uh, make back a little bit of business over the summer, and it sounds like this coming week, um, trying to get a sense of, you know, we saw in uh, Commissioner Pichek's modeling how important it is. How much is at stake, I guess, um, in the next few weeks for lodging and hospitality to try and make back some of their needed business? Yeah, they'll never make back uh, the gain or the losses uh, that they've uh, experienced at this point in time. We can only help in some respects. Uh, you saw on the travel map the, the uh, some of the the data uh, that Commissioner Pijak had laid out. Uh, you know, our our the amount of travel into Vermont has been, um, in, in some respects, mimicking uh, 2019, but about a 40 percent decline uh, since then. But it it goes through the highs and lows in the same uh, trajectory. Um, so uh, we haven't, we'll see a decline uh, in the not too dear and uh, not too distant future uh, in terms of travel. So we're hoping uh, that they can uh, make enough to, to hold on, uh, but we still have to provide assistance uh, to them because uh, this is going to be a long winter. Thank you. Uh, Governor, the, uh, back to the uh, to the veto, um, is this way more politics than it is um, than it is actually uh, environmental policy? Because you're talking about, you know, Democratic House and Senate. Uh, the Attorney General came out with a letter saying that, or saying that he upholds that it's constitutional. Um, there have been several fundraising letters that have come out from Democrats, including your opponent, uh, criticizing your, uh, your veto. I mean, how much of this is actually for the good of the... Well, I want to defend the uh, Attorney General in some respects. I know he came out and said that it, uh, from his standpoint, uh, passed the constitutional question, uh, but they were asking the wrong question. Um, the, again, the legislature has the authority to abdicate their own position. They can give up their authority. Uh, but, uh, but the, and that was the question that was asked of the Attorney General. I don't know as anyone has asked the uh, Attorney General whether the legislature has the authority uh, to abdicate the governor's position, um, regardless, not just me, any governor. Um, so I think this sends, uh, sets a dangerous precedent. Uh, I think it is suspect uh, being in a an election year uh, to, to put something like this out. Uh, it does uh, give uh, the legislature a pass in some respects, not to have to make these tough decisions, not to have to, to go out before the people and pass uh, anything that they might uh, feel is necessary uh, to address climate change. These are going to be tough. This is going to be really difficult. And, uh, and again, <clears throat> I, I think it's, uh, it's a dangerous precedent. And, uh, and I do think it has uh, political overtones. Uh, and Dr. Levine, the, um, the, or or you, Governor, the um, the sh very small amount of cases in uh, the K through 12, especially, um, bodes well, it seems, for uh, for us going forward with uh, with the plans. Do you see uh, an acceleration of uh, these schools going to uh, you know more more in classroom? Well, 
I, I, again, I, I'll answer part of that. Uh, from my standpoint, I certainly hope so, um, but it's up to them. Uh, we've given that flexibility uh, for them to provide, you know, some certainty uh, to, to prove ourselves in some respect, to see what was going to happen. Um, two weeks uh, maybe isn't enough for them to make a decision to go to more in-person instruction at this point, uh, but I think it helps. And uh, the, the longer we go uh, with the low uh, number of cases, uh, the, the better off we're going to be because we know uh, based on all of the experts uh, that have come before us and been in these press conferences, we know what's best for the kids. In-person instruction is best for the kids. Uh, so the sooner we get there, the better off they're going to be. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah, I can. Uh, I can ask uh, Secretary French to weigh in on this as well. Yeah. Thank you, Governor. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I would agree. I mean, just as much as we're paying attention to the data, which continues to be positive, I think you know, as you alluded to, the other dynamic is school districts need to get more comfortable actually implementing the guidance, and that's that's an assumption. Uh, that we make when we publish guidance, but the actual practical application of the guidance needs to be uh, implemented. And I think um, I would expect as folks get more comfortable with that, uh, we'll see more districts move to in person because I think there are compelling educational reasons uh, why we need to do that. And I know all educators uh, believe strongly in the uh, preference for in person instruction, but really a function of them just getting more comfortable as, as a school, as a school district system, and following the health guidance. Yeah. Yeah. The only thing I'll add is that the, the health guidance is already there and it's in place and it's available. It's a matter of following the data and the comfort with the schools as to where they are now and where they want to get to. Um, you know, in terms of guidance regarding um, more congregate settings like cafeterias, uh, phys ed classes, things of that sort. Uh, so. The foundation is already laid, and it's just a matter of seeing how these few weeks go. And just briefly, Dr. while you're there, uh, do you have any sort of a recommendation as far as uh, uh, a dosage of creamy for, <laughs> for our, our members? You know, uh, since, since uh, Secretary Tevitz did uh, begin this, I will say that I believe that moderation in everything. <laughs> so one can have wonderful time with creamies, but too much of a good thing can be sometimes too much. All right, we'll move to the phone, starting with Mike Donahue, the Islander. Uh, thank you, Governor and Secretary Tebbitt for that creamy update. Uh, <laughs> just for the record, uh, Governor Dean is on record that Allen Home Farms in Grand Isle County has the best maple creamies in Vermont, so I just <laughs> want to put a plug in for Grand Isle County. And Governor and Commissioner Pichek, thank you for releasing the specific breakdowns on COVID testing for university and colleges, much like you do for the towns and cities. It's important for Vermonters to know how kids are behaving in light of what's going on, even as close as Plattsburgh and Hanover. And uh, I did notice that you had to make an adjustment in the previously announced numbers, but I'm glad we're moving forward. Governor, on another transparency issue, there's a new directive from your administration that blocks Vermont state troopers from their long-standing routine releasing of information about juveniles that are killed and injured in car crashes, that are victims of homicides, drownings, subjects to amber alerts, that they're lost while skiing or hunting. This temporary order goes against your own policy that you signed off on and We've heard from state troopers in the field since the directive came out at 10 o'clock last Friday night that they're concerned about the lack of transparency to taxpayers now at a time when public is clamoring for more transparency by police. Commissioner Sterling did roll it back a little bit about Amber Alerts, I guess, yesterday, but no other Vermont department has <clears throat> adopted this. When might we see the state police go back to a transparency agency? Um, I know Commissioner Sherling is on the line. I'm going to let him fill us in on some of the details. Commissioner Sherling. Thank you, Governor. Uh, Mike, as you know, we, uh, we discussed this at length yesterday. Uh, this is a temporary hold as we do a legal analysis. There was, as, as we discussed, there was a, 
uh, an event that uh, raised some concerns by a couple of different attorneys, including a, a prosecutor and a private attorney, on compliance with uh, with a variety of potentially conflicting laws as it relates to juvenile records. And we're just doing an assessment, so this is, a, as uh, you're aware, this is a temporary hold as we do a legal assessment. But, but there's never been an issue before. I mean, I, I can appreciate a defense lawyer who's getting paid by a family. The, the driver who killed the two people down in uh, Charlotte and by being on the wrong side of the highway, trying not to have the name put out, even though it's not been put out. Uh, you know, should Vermont policy be based on that family or should it be based on the totality of the situation? should be based on the existing legal standard and what we're trying to assess is whether there are conflicts. Uh, this wasn't an advocacy position taken by one person. Uh, prosecutor's office weighed in as well and uh, attorneys within state government are taking a look at it to try to uh, ensure that we're in compliance with the law. That prosecutor's office, the one that's arguing for no bail on people? I'm sorry, there was background. I had background noise. I couldn't hear the last part of the question. In the prosecutor's office, is that the one that's arguing for no bail uh, to let everybody out without bail? Yeah, as I indicated yesterday, I, I haven't taken a deep dive. Uh, our legal counsel indicated it was coming from a prosecutor's office, and I'm leaving it in the attorney's hands for now, and uh, we'll work on it as quickly as possible and uh, have a resolution as soon as that work is done. Getting back to my original question, Governor, when might you lift that policy and not leave it up to maybe the commissioner? Well, I, you know, I, uh, I, I want to rely on my experts, uh, the expertise of my team, uh, and um, and I'm relying on on the uh, uh, public safety uh, to advise me on this as well. So we want to uh, resolve this just as quick as we possibly can. Uh, and if it's safe to do so, we'll go back to what we were doing before. Uh, but these are, you know, when we set a precedent uh, in, in this manner from a legal aspect, uh, we could be affecting uh, future cases. So we just want to make sure that we're on the right side of this. But, but the, under the order, if a person is killed in a homicide or car crash or whatever, the policy or the directive now says their name won't be released, even though their name will be on the obituary the next day in the paper. I mean, it seems a little, uh, uh, we'll say, whatever. Yeah, yeah again, yeah. again, this is a a yeah. These are juveniles we're, we're talking about here. Uh, and uh, again, we just want to make sure we get this right and we'll, uh, we'll, get, we'll get this resolved just as quick as we possibly can. Uh, anytime you right. bring lawyers into uh, any dispute, it, it takes a little time. Okay, and one quick follow-up. Uh, yesterday, uh, high schools have been gearing up to begin play next week, and the state pulled the plug on that long-standing goal. And one reporter told me this morning that his news outlet had been told both the health and education department said to them that they never really thought that would happen next week. Uh, I'm just wondering what has happened uh, either through education or through health that made uh, all this talk that student athletes and parents, classmates, fans were waiting for sports to start as a great distraction to what is going on. What, yeah. what, what is the real deadline for high school sports to resume? Well, I don't know if there's a real deadline. Um, I think there were goals and hopes uh, established, but uh, Secretary French, do you want to describe what, um, what had transpired earlier? Yeah, hi, Mike. Um, I would just I'd start to say that you know we see sports as essential uh, to academics and the social emotional growth of students. So it's something we're very much, I say, keenly interested in supporting. Um, I think there was some miscommunication or guidance. I think was pretty clear uh, that we intended to examine what we call the transition from step two to step three uh, at the end of this month, um, and pretty much after the first two weeks of school. And we started that process uh, this week with the Department of Health. Um, apparently, some school districts have interpreted that and actually have scheduled uh, games to begin next week. Uh, it was not our intention, so it's something we're actively uh, working on, and we just had to alert to folks that that conversation is moving forward, essentially, as scheduled. 
But when might you give them a green light to start scheduling a game? I mean, it, obviously they must have gotten some miscommunication from the agency that they went out and scheduled these games and got bus rented, buses rented and everything like that. Yeah, but I think some the, information. Yeah, it's, it's part of the challenge I think we have in this emergency because on the one hand, we try to uh, foreshadow um, our decision making, uh, but sometimes that gets misinterpreted. Um, so I think, you know, it's clearly something we need to work on. But um, what we signaled to superintendents yesterday is that we intend to pick up this conversation next week and endeavor hopefully to identify a specific date when we make that transition. Um, so folks like, will have a week to plan. I mean, it, it also is important to note that that transition we call step two to step three uh, has implications for school operations as much as athletics. So there's some aspects particularly around uh, using cafeterias and schools uh, that requires us to give about a week's notice so the food service folks can start to prepare. So I think next week we'll have more information on this. All right, we've got to move it, to our next question. It just seems odd that Stephanie High School had miscommunication with your agency. I, that's the only thing. Mike, you can take a look at the guidance yeah. and the wording, but we've got to move to our next question. The guidance lays out the wording so you can see it for yourself. Cat uh, WCAX. Hi, this question is likely for Dr. Levine. Following up on our question that we posed to Dr. Fauci on Tuesday about rapid testing, the doctor indicated newer rapid tests are more accurate. So what role is rapid testing going to be playing in Vermont's COVID-19 strategy as we move forward? <clears throat> Thank you for that question, um, because that's a, under intense discussion at the health department right now. Um, as you know, uh, from our experience with antibody testing, which is a different set of testing, we um, had convened a panel of uh, clinicians and public health experts and laboratory medicine experts, infectious disease experts, to examine that, and they provided us with a report. Um, that same working group, which is now under the rubric of a term scientific advisory committee, is uh, preparing a further report on these rapid tests and um, will be forthcoming, I think, in the very near future. The, to get down to a little bit of uh, forecasting about what that will show, um, we clearly know that the rapid antigen tests uh, have a definite role in uh, acute care settings where people may be presenting in the first five days with COVID-19 symptoms. The federal government has recently launched an effort to send a lot of antigen platforms to long-term care facilities throughout the entire country, as well as another form of rapid test uh, that's done on a card uh, around the country. Uh, and the guidance regarding those is just happening as we speak this week and next week uh, to give a little more guidance as to the appropriate role. The concerns we have are using those in settings where people are asymptomatic, but they're being used for what I would term screening. Just surveilling that population, usually of workers or residents in such facilities, and um, seeing if there's any infection present. That's where there's more controversy in the role, but it seems that if one does this on a repetitive basis at regular intervals, whatever those intervals might be decided to be, that you increase the reliability of using those tools in these settings. So that's the kind of um, feedback I want to get back from not only the federal government regarding their guidance, but also our scientific advisory group. Uh, so I don't think it'll be long. Uh, certainly during the month of September when we'll be very clearly articulating, most likely through a health alert notification to the clinical world, uh, how we perceive the role of those tests in Vermont. So would they play a role then at all for members of the public to enter facilities, like you mentioned, of long-term care? Would it be a, a, type, a type of thing where a family could get screened and then if they come back negative visit or is that not something that the health department is comfortable with the accuracy of yet yeah that's that that one i can't answer clearly right now that that remains to be seen because that's again screening an asymptomatic person one time 
as opposed to screening the population of that facility on a regular basis? Um, those are the kind of answers we're looking for. So I, I won't answer your question directly just yet. Thank you. Sure. Greg, the county courier. Good afternoon, Governor. Um, I was going to ask you about the VST memo that Mike Donahue brought up, but a uh, little short-sighted, I guess, on my part that I might get a scoop on uh, the journalistic legend in Vermont. Um, on a side note, the person that told me about it was also pretty worried about transparency. Um, and a note about uh, Secretary Tebbett's uh, statement on creamies being essential, that might, you know, come as pretty exciting news to many Vermonters in the case of the uh, economy has to shut down again. Um, anyway, moving on to, to my secondary question here. Uh, a follow-up on what you were talking about in the beginning here. Um, your administration is touting uh, two-tenths of one percent uh, positivity rate, uh, but we're, we're testing a lot of people. Um, and in some states, they're only testing symptomatic people. So I'm wondering if uh, your administration is doing any sort of assessment to be able to compare apples to apples with the states that are only testing asymptomatic people and, and what the uh, positivity rate is in Vermont for symptomatic people. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Commissioner Pichak to weigh in on this one. Um, but uh, again, from my standpoint, <clears throat> um, most, I mean, we're, we're testing both symptomatic and asymptomatic people. Um, and I think most states are, I don't know of uh, who is just testing symptomatic. But uh, Commissioner Pichak. So we're not familiar with any states that are testing at this point only symptomatic individuals. Uh, there could be a state or two out there, but when you do look at the national level, there is still a pretty high level of testing going on across the country, and the national positivity rate um, is pushing closer to 5%. Um, so, you know, that increase, that decreased positivity rate over time, although ticking up nationally uh, in the past week or so, you know, is indicative of um, considerable amount of testing that went on during college restart and, and potentially K through 12 restart across the country as well. So uh, we think it's a pretty fair comparison when you look just at the positivity rate uh, mm -hmm. across the entire country. And then, of course, if you look at just the um, aggregate number of cases as well on a per capita basis, we're clearly lowest in the country on that measurement uh, also. Okay. And um, a, a quick question. I don't know if it's for the governor or for... Uh, Commissioner Harrison, um, some new data is showing that the unemployment level has dropped again. Uh, we're hearing from employers that are concerned that there's still no job search requirement. Uh, and I talked to one employer, actually I talked to an employee of an employer that, that they're actually having to truck people in from out of state to fill the roles uh, in, their, in their job. Um, when can Vermonters start to expect to see a, a work requirement again, or a, a job search requirement again? Yeah, well, again, as I stated uh, earlier, when we get to a point, uh, I think we have about 35,000 uh, unemployed Vermonters at this uh, point between unemployment and, and the PUA. Um, and I would comment on the, uh, uh, on the recent uh, news about uh, the lower unemployment and so forth. The, unfortunately, the, the formula uh, that has been utilized in, to determine these factors uh, doesn't rely on the reality of the times, and uh, and I don't believe it's accurate uh, considering the uh, the, uh, the pandemic. So uh, we'll work our way through that. Uh, but until we get to a point where we have uh, more jobs, uh, you know, available, uh, we don't. And again, we're getting there. Uh, every time we turn take a turn of the spigot. Uh, there are more opportunities, but uh, for those, uh, the vast majority of those on unemployment, there aren't jobs available for them. But, but again, uh, every time we take a turn of the spigot, we get closer. So I would expect uh, if we continue down this path, uh, we'll be able to implement those work search uh, programs within the next uh, two or three months. A, a, a reader sent a uh, screen cap of a progressive candidate Facebook page uh, here in Franklin County 
basically complaining that she couldn't make her bills, she was unemployed, uh, and when somebody commented, you know, hey, you can go work here, you can go work there, her comment back was, well, I wouldn't stoop to that level. Um, it, isn't it a little short-sighted to think that, you know, with 35,000 people without, uh, without employment that we could maybe get down to 25,000? No, I, I, I believe uh, that we will get there eventually. Uh, again, we've come a long ways from the over 90,000 we had uh, not too long ago. Uh, so we're making gains, uh, and again, we want to put people back to work, get them off uh, from unemployment, uh, and uh, get them back into the, the jobs they even previously held. But the hospitality sector is a uh, is problematic in a number of uh, number of ways, and uh, we've we've talked about that a lot over the last uh, few months. And uh, but turning again, opening up lodging a bit, will uh, will hopefully uh, put more people back to work, and uh, and looking for other opportunities as well. So uh, we'll continue to take these steps, and uh, when we get to a point where we see more jobs opening up, and uh, we'll put the work search requirements back into place. Okay, I'll follow up on it another another day. Uh, I, I guess the concern was is that uh, you know people aren't having to take jobs that they don't want just to take a job, and I'll leave it at that. Okay, thank you. Hadley, the Valley Reporter. Hi, Governor. I had also planned to ask about Mike Donahue's Times article regarding. Um, releasing the names of juveniles and accidents, but since he already mentioned it, I'll move on to something else. So here's a question for Dr. Levine. Um, as we know, two students at Cross Brook Middle School in Duxbury tested positive for coronavirus last week, uh, which led to a school closure and then contact tracing and testing of over 20 other students and staff. Um, and then earlier today, you mentioned that all tests done as a result of that contact tracing were negative, but then looking at page seven of your slide deck um, that you showed earlier today um, that shows weekly cases per county, we see that in Washington County, where Cross Brook is located, um, cases jump from 10 cases a week to 30 new cases a week. So my question is, why are we seeing a spike in cases in Washington County if all tests related to the Cross the Brook closure were negative? And where are those, where's the increase coming from? I'll have uh, either Commissioner Pichek uh, may weigh in as well, but uh, I'll ask Dr. Levine. It's actually not my slide, it's, not, it's Commissioner Pichak's slide, so I'm going to let him explain that aspect and then I'll be happy to handle more about that. So I think the slide that you're referring to, we didn't talk about it publicly today, but it's in our full presentation and um, it looks at the county by county numbers for the week um, on a per capita basis, uh, not on an aggregate number, so it's not 30 new cases this week, but they might have 30 new cases per 100,000, for example, this week. Um, the health department does include that county by county data on its dashboard, um, so I'd encourage you to look at that. I will just add to that that those who chose to attend the pop-up, which does not mean every contact, um, and were tested at the pop-up were negative. If there are any individuals that actually develop some symptoms and have gone through the healthcare system to get their test, we may not have that result yet. Uh, but to the best of our knowledge, all the contacts who got tested through our pop-up are negative. Doesn't mean um, that they should not have done what they did. The quarantine is the essential item. Uh, the test is. Um, nice for us to have a handle on, but the quarantine was the essential action. Okay, so um, there's no other Washington County outbreak that you know of that could be responsible for the rising cases in that county? No, because again, it, we're, we're not talking absolute number of cases, we're talking a, a rate per 100,000. 
And it doesn't take okay. much in a small population to have that rate vary, which is why the travel map changes sometimes uh, because it may not take a huge change to actually uh, have an impact on that. And just to be clear, the, the 30 was the rate, not the number yes. of cases. The 30 is the so rate, not, not the number. To a number of 30. Yeah, we only had 46 in the state uh, for the whole week. Um, and clearly 30 were not in Washington County. Gotcha. All set, Kat Hadley? Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I, I would just like to re reassure everyone, I watch these numbers uh, every single day. Uh, and uh, I know that the Secretary Smith does as well because he sends them to me about 2 a.m. So if there were 30 cases in Washington County, the county I grew up in and live in, um, I would take notice. So there were not 30 cases, 30 new cases in the last week in Washington County. All right, Keith, the Rutland Herald. Keith, the Rutland Herald. Star six to unmute, Keith. And Hi, everybody. Yep. Yeah, go ahead, Keith. Uh, okay, thank you, Governor. Um, so last week, I believe it was reported that the head of the Rutland area, NAACP, had decided to leave her home due to um, just months of racial harassment. Um, this would be probably the second time that I'm aware of that the Providence Vermont black leader has been uh, effectively run out of town by racial harassment through the internet uh, other places. I am wondering, besides maybe some statements I've seen that say that's horrible and shouldn't be happening, if there's and going to be any concrete um, action to prevent things like this from happening. Yeah. Um, you know, this is a, uh, a problem. As I said before, uh, we're not insulated from this in Vermont, and we have to do better. And so, uh, we put together our racial equity uh, panel. Um, we uh, have uh, have listened uh, to many of the uh, of the findings. Um, we're hoping to move forward with that, uh, but it's going to take all of us uh, pulling in the same direction to make this happen, and uh, and and really face uh, that we have a a, uh, a real issue on our hands uh, as a country. Uh, but as a state as well. So every single one of us has to do our part. Uh, I think you can expect uh, that we will continue to take steps forward. Um, again, not just uh, me uh, and our administration, uh, but the legislature as well uh, in, the, uh, in the coming weeks and months. So uh, we'll, um, again, we all need to do better and face the reality uh, that we're not insulated uh, from racism. Do you have any sense of what we might see sooner rather than later? Um, there will be, I think we'll, we're going to release uh, some of what the racial equity uh, panel has put together, and that should be released, I, I believe, in the next week or so. So you should see some of, um, the, some of their uh, um, issues that they'd like to bring forward and suggestions. Thank you. Thank you. Aaron, VT Digger. Um, I, uh, I, have, I have a question from the governor about some recent news, um, more how do you feel about this bill, how do you feel about that bill. Uh, this time it's the Marijuana Tax and Regulate Bill, which is going to be heading to your desk next week. Uh, it includes many of the provisions you've asked for, like provisions for town investments, uh, in drug prevention, education measures, but it doesn't include saliva testing for police without a warrant, which you said you'd want if you were to support the bill. Uh, how do you feel about it now? Are you planning the veto, or do you want to let it become law? Yeah, we'll, we'll see. Um, I haven't looked at the bill. It has been my top priority, obviously a priority for the legislature and legislative leadership. Uh, and uh, so it's been passed. I will uh, give great credit to those uh, who I don't believe uh, had any uh, thoughts of uh, meeting some of uh, my concerns, but they've done so. Uh, they, uh, 
uh, they move forward. And, you know, uh, as I reflect on the Global Warming Solutions Act and the difference between uh, the two bills uh, and, and my uh, address or them addressing the concerns I had uh, with the uh, regulation, marijuana regulation and taxation bill versus the Global Warming Solutions Act, it's a stark difference. Uh, even the panel, I mean, the, 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 uh, they created a panel um, and maybe abdicated some of their position there, but they did, it's coming back. Any suggestions by the marijuana a panel that they, uh, they uh, put into their bill uh, is going to come back to the legislature and they're going to vote on it and they're going to consider that. I mean, that's the way to do things. So um, they've come a long ways. Uh, I'll, I'll be considering that over the next one. We do receive the bill. We haven't received it yet, uh, but, uh, but I'll consider that. And, uh, and again, they've come a long ways, and, and um, we'll, see, we'll see what happens. I know there are some, um, some groups that I hadn't uh, heard from before uh, have uh, had voiced their opposition to this over the last couple of days, and I don't know if they went to the legislature uh, with their concerns and testified over the last uh, week or two, but again, I um, I just saw an uptick in some organizations coming forward that I who I hadn't heard from before. Okay, thank you. Um, another thing that's been in the news lately is Current Hatton uh, getting its license with DCF Fold because of allegations of sexual misconduct at Fold. Uh, would you support the State Board of Education pulling its license to operate as an independent school? I'm going to ask Secretary uh, French uh, to weigh in first, but then uh, Secretary Smith uh, might have some updates as well. Secretary French? Yes, thank you. Um, yes, we are reviewing the situation. We haven't formulated a recommendation for the State Board yet, but the State Board is very interested uh, in the status of the school. Um, particularly with DCF uh, revoking its uh, credential that essentially precipitates the uh, necessary consideration of, of their ability to operate as an independent school. Uh, but it's also important that we get all the facts and uh, give the school an opportunity to uh, address the concerns to our satisfaction. Okay, thank you. I think uh, Secretary Smith said that uh, um, Secretary French had covered all the details he was going to uh, bring forth. Okay, um, and one, one last quick question. The um, this model presentation has three cases listed, and I just want to confirm that uh, at schools, at K-12 schools, I just want to confirm that the most current data, um, that there haven't been cases in like the past, you know, two or three days or something like that. It's, it's, it's the three cases at K-12? Yeah, not that we're aware of. Those are the only three cases that we know of at this point in time. Okay, thank you. Joe, Barton Chronicle. Hello. Um, I guess this is for Dr. Levine. Um, one of my coworkers told me that her son um, was in a position where he needed to be tested. Uh, he had to take a week off from work. Uh, did it, no problem there. He went and had a test, and this was over Labor Day weekend, but it took, um, I think, five or six days for the test result to come back. Fortunately, it was negative, but um, my coworker said that uh, they had to repeatedly get in touch with um, the facility where the test was done. It was a hospital. And um, they finally got the word that it was negative, but never received uh, a written report. And um, I realized that I and probably a lot of people have no idea of what to expect from the process even now with all the testing being done. And I wondered if you could clarify that. Yeah. We'll have uh, Secretary Smith. Joe, thanks for the question, and and obviously um, at some point um, I'd like to follow up with you because what we're seeing are uh, we monitor uh, these testing uh, turnaround times by labs uh, pretty regularly and um, play close pay close attention to them. 
Obviously, the state uh, lab is the fastest, um, but there are other labs out there um, doing testing as well. And the prior week, our average turnaround time is 2.1 uh, days. Uh, prior week was 1.9 days. Uh, the, 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 largest, uh, uh, the largest facility that does testing outside of the state lab is called the Broad Institute. Their average is 1.9. But it does um, vary depending on what labs you have. But again, our average turnaround days is about 2.1. And again, with the state lab, it's, it's, it's quicker than, than that. There were, um, the, the total tests in the last seven days are 23,000 tests. So there's been a lot of testing going on. I would like to, um, I'll make sure my office calls you because we would like to follow up on that and just find out what are, what's happening. We've instituted, um, this probably went through a hospital. So it, it probably was a sort of different sort of, uh, uh, lab than what you know normally in a pop-up site will will use so we'll try to find out what's going on thank you very much Tim, Tim from my business magazine hi governor both uh, and the unemployment rate both uh, you today and Michael Harrington press release today indicated uh, uh, that they felt that the census was inaccurate and I was wondering um, because of the, the, the numbers are so dramatically lower from the July numbers in the August report is this something that that you are concerned goes all the way back to April are all these numbers uh, perhaps inaccurate going back that far and what might be the real accurate number uh, for the unemployment rate the labor force and a dramatic decrease in uh, total number of employed also. Um, yeah, Commissioner Harrington, do you have any thoughts on that? Sure, I'll also point out we have our chief economist on the line, Matthew Barowitz, who may want to chime in as well. But um, it's not necessarily that the data or the numbers are inaccurate. The problem that we see in the numbers that are being reported is that when we calculate the unemployment rate for the state or the labor force, uh, number that is based on a household survey conducted by the U.S. Census Bureau, and it really uh, asks the question of whether or not people are uh, actively uh, looking for work and able uh, to accept work if offered, and determines whether individuals are attached to the labor market. And unfortunately, what it does not take into consideration is the number of people who are actually filing for and receiving unemployment insurance benefits. And so um, for the first time uh, in a long time or, or in recent history, um, the number of people receiving unemployment insurance benefits is actually higher um, and than, the, um, than the number of people who are um, are detached from the labor force. And so uh, from that perspective, again, it's not that the numbers um, being calculated are, are miscalculated, it's that um, one uh, number being calculated is not truly representative of the, the world in which we're living and the climate in which we're living. You know, so our rate shows, based on the, the survey, that there is uh, only 4.8% um, uh, of the, the um, labor force is unemployed when really we know there are uh, 30 plus thousand Vermonters who are actually uh, receiving benefits. Matt, did you have anything else you wanted to add? Uh, yes, good morning, Commissioner. Uh, thank you for the opportunity and I appreciate the question. Um, I think what this comes back down to is that historically people look to the unemployment rate, uh, right or wrong, as a universal metric of overall economic health. And so when you see a sharp decline in the unemployment rate, most people think that the economic conditions are improving. And what we he see here, as the commissioner uh, correctly pointed out, is it's really a definitional distinction of how the federal government defines what it means to be quote unquote unemployed. 
Um, and so by not uh, being required to do a work search, if people are saying they are not currently actively seeking and pursuing work, they are not considered to be part of the labor force. As a result, when you see this uh, unemployment rate of uh, 4.8%, uh, you would think that on balance, that must mean that the employment levels are high and uh, correspondingly so. But that is not the case where we know that the labor force is contracted, employment is down. Even though businesses are reporting, employment is increasing. Um, but from the, ha uh, the household standpoint, uh, this data just paints a much different picture than what a traditional 4.8% unemployment would reflect. Uh, and uh, sort of following from that, why would there be such a dramatic uh, change <coughs> from July to August in, in this case? When I, I assume they've been doing the same, the, the same survey all along. Uh, that's a good question. They have been doing the same survey all along. Uh, this survey, again, is administered by the U.S. Census Bureau. It is done in partnership with my federal partners, the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And uh, the two of those organizations came together early on and agreed they would not change definitions, they would not change methodology, even in the face of this uh, global health pandemic, such that the data would be comparable over time. But I think what the commissioner and the governor are expressing is just frustration with that this global health pandemic does not align with traditional economic downturns. And as such, when you see these sharp declines, um, you know, What's happened here is um, the way the methodology is done, there can be uh, one of two things. One, um, the models are meant to not be overly reactive. So even when we saw the initial response in April, um, or excuse me, March, and some of March and most of April, the model takes a little while to acclimate. It's like turning a boat. It takes a little bit of course correction and then it's on its way. And so what's happened now is we've had several months in the history showing uh, downward pressure on both employment and um, and recently unemployment, and the model has kind of caught a little bit of speed in this and as such it is accelerated in this month. And so even should um, a work search be reinstituted, it, these numbers will not just magically return around. Again, like a bow, it takes a course correction and the model will, will slowly acclimate to the new reality. All right, great, thank you, Matthew. Avery, WCAX. Governor Scott, as I'm sure you've heard, Burlington High School is closed for at least the rest of the semester of the building because of PCB contamination. And we've heard from viewers that are maybe worried that their school also has this type of contamination since it was widely used in the 60s and 70s when a lot of them were built. Um, so do you think this is a time for another study on PCB statewide? Yeah, um, you know, this is concerning, especially for uh, those in the Burlington community and for the school itself. Um, but it seems as though there's a narrow uh, point in time when some of these construction materials were used back in the 70s when uh, this, uh, this school was built. Um, so I think you can, we can narrow down uh, what schools may be affected and what schools aren't. Uh, but, uh, but we need to pay attention to this, obviously. And uh, this is uh, something in some respects uh, new. Uh, the PCBs were, were uh, established as being uh, a problematic uh, over the last uh, few years by the federal government. Um, so this is, uh, you know, again, uncharted uh, territory, so to speak. Um, but, uh, but I would agree, we need to pay attention to this. And uh, would looking into something like this be uh, something the state would help with funding, or would you see that as something that local towns would, uh, local tax payers would Again, too, too early to tell. I, I think there will be a conversation. I would imagine there will be a conversation with the legislature. Uh, over the next uh, session. Uh, these aren't easy tests uh, to, uh, to put into place. Um, it's uh, quite extensive, quite expensive. Uh, so uh, we have to make sure that we, we narrow it as best we can, but too early to tell who and how it's going to be paid for. Thank you, Governor. Liam, VPR. Governor, I'm just wondering what Hi, um, this is a question for Secretary Smith. Um, I'm just wondering if you could provide an update on the outbreak um, of COVID-19 among the Mississippi inmates. I think we can, Avery. Yeah. Yes, um, I 
can report very good news with the uh, Mississippi inmates. We uh, currently have uh, what we prior we had total prior positive uh, tests at Mississippi of 179. That's about 84.8 percent of the total population. Um, we have 178 uh, in recovery uh, today. I mean, one is one is going into recovery today. Recovery means that we're starting to move them into the general population uh, because we see that they're recover uh, recovered. We have one that is still in quarantine uh, and is isolated. Uh, we have 28 that are a negative test and four that uh, through the whole process refuse to take a test. Uh, we treat them as negative, uh, as positives, excuse me. Uh, for the purposes of this, and they're quarantined in different in, in uh, different sections. But um, pretty good news. Uh, we don't have anybody in uh, the hospital, uh, and we uh, don't have anybody, I believe, in the infirmary as as I speak. So it sounds like the majority of the, the folks that had tested positive are now in recovery. I mean, at what? Point, would you consider this over? Uh, yeah, I guess, I, guess I, 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 I think we're pretty much looking at it as over. Okay. Um, do you have, when's the next time you're going to be doing mass testing? I mean, you know, this, you weren't testing before. I know that now this facility is part of the rotation. Um, but how are you going to ensure that something like this doesn't happen again? Well, we will be testing that, uh, the Vermont inmates in that facility on September 28th. We're still in discussions with. Uh, core civic on making sure that we don't have spread from other parts of that uh, facility uh, and we are also um, linking video linking to that facility so we have 24 7 eyes on that facility from a video uh, purpose but we will be starting uh, system testing uh, on a rotation basis just like we did with um, St. Johnsbury, I think this week, uh, where we, where we had um, Northeast Correctional Facility had uh, zero positives uh, out of the 258 staff and inmates that we tested there this week. We're going to put a, we're going to put Mississippi in that same rotation uh, process, and their first up is September 28th, and we'll continue to rotate them through uh, regular testing, just like we do the other facilities. And I will just be testing the Vermont inmates in Mississippi, not the others that are in the facility. I mean, there's a lot of folks that are, that are testing. Yeah, you got to remember the way that it's that it's uh, set up down there. We're in separate pods. We just got to make sure that um, uh, those those pods are are kept clean in terms of virus spread. And the Corrections Department is working on that right now to make sure that that doesn't happen. The best way would be that CoreCivic tests the entire facility on the same basis that Vermont uh, does it. But that gets complicated with other states' inmates as well because there has to be some sort of coordination with other states. But the best way to do it right now is to keep our pods that are there. I, I think we have three pods that are there clean of the virus and right now um, we have that uh, we have that cleanliness within within those pods and just remember most of our most of our um, uh, inmates down there have have had the virus and so uh, we really have to protect them in the future and the ones that have not tested positive down there and finally are, are you Expecting to renew the contract with Court Civic. I know that that is going to be coming up soon. Yeah, I, I think the governor has said this, and I've said this in the past. Um, we're putting different provisions in there to safeguard against, to, to make sure that we have testing and eyes on the the um, on the ground down there uh, with a video. Uh, but I expect that we will probably be renewing one year only that contract. I also expect that we'll probably, you know, we have gone from uh, 219 to 211 just recently. We have eight inmates that have returned back to Vermont. I, I, will, I will think 
over the next uh, fiscal year, you will see that number continue to decrease as, uh, as we move forward and as we figure out how to sort of uh, reconfigure our facilities up here as uh, in this COVID environment, what has prohibited us in this uh, COVID environment and bringing more people back is that we need a quarantine space. But also, we've had sort of low case counts because, um, because during the height of the pandemic, the judicial system was virtually shut down. Thank you. Guy Page. Two questions for the Health Department Commissioner. Uh, Tuesday, you asked Dr. Fauci to discuss COVID vaccination. Some Vermont opponents of mandatory vaccination say pharmaceutical companies will enjoy legal immunity from damages if the vaccine proves unsafe. Is this true? And if so, what protections do Vermonters have in the event of personal injury from an unsafe vaccine? So from the beginning, um, there's no talk of mandatory vaccination, just to take that off the table at the moment. That, that has not been um, anything anyone nationally or in any state yet, and certainly not in Vermont, has been entertained. Though people are concerned about uh, Americans' reluctance based on surveys that have come out recently uh, to trust the vaccine. But that has much more to do with the politicization of the process. With regard to indemnity and all the other questions you asked, um, those are questions really for the legal team. Um, and I can't answer them for you here. We can certainly bring them to the legal team and um, begin those discussions. Um, clearly, that, that will go way beyond Vermont. That, what you're describing in terms of scenarios would be a national issue. Um, so I'm sure that there would be some anticipation of this because we don't want to get in the way of delivering in a rapid fashion an efficacious and safe vaccine to the population. Uh, last thing we need is concerns that, like you raise. So um, I will bring it back to my team, see if there's any awareness of what's going on nationally. But that's as much as I can give you today. Okay, thank you. Um, also, your website says, uh, there's a quote on there, that no single person or group of people are more likely than others to spread COVID-19 and cautions against stigmatizing them. Um, I, I, I was a little baffled as to what you were talking about. Are, are you referring to stigmatization of an individual or a group of people? And if so, who? Yeah, so it's a very real phenomenon, which is why we're always very, very highly interested in protecting confidentiality and patient-specific data. Um, because it turns out, um, whether it's ill-intended or not ill-intended, um, when people find out that a certain person or a certain group of people or a certain facility um, has had COVID, um, it does sometimes lead to what we're terming stigmatization. Um, through no ill efforts of the people who were afflicted. Um, it's not like they intentionally um, got infected and tried to spread COVID to others. Um, they're just unfortunate at that point in time. As we say, it's the air we breathe, and we all breathe the same air together. So uh, we, we just are very concerned about that. Um, and as, you know, as it comes to our reporting, you know, whether it's a uh, school or a child care or a uh, hospitality sector facility, um, words matter. And it's never, it, it's almost never the fault of that facility or that person that COVID ended up there. Um, and it doesn't mean that they forever have a, you know, black star uh, and can't be gold star again. Um, it's just an unfortunate circumstance that they get through. 
Um, and so I, I think that's what we were trying to emphasize. Uh, we're not pointing at any specific group or anything of that sort. Uh, some of it is just uh, unfortunate human nature. So has that happened? Are you saying in Vermont that has happened? Actually, yes. Okay. Uh, is it a, are we talking ethnic groups or, uh, or facilities or give, give me a little bit more direction as to who suffered this? Um, individuals and facilities. Okay. Thank you. Steve, NEK TV. Can you hear me? We can, Steve. Great, thanks. Uh, just as a reminder um, that uh, cheese whiz is really a, supposedly a, a dairy product, and Slim Jims are made from meat, but the former isn't really cheese, and the latter isn't really sausage. And, uh, and I know the standards of uh, ice cream when they tried to open a, an ice cream plant down in Hardwick. Uh, there are strict standards regarding the term ice cream. And uh, on top of that, there's an air factor too, uh, which is why uh, cheap ice cream at, uh, at, at the grocery store weighs so much less than the uh, more expensive stuff. But anyways, I wanted to thank uh, Anson Tibbetts for the uh, clarification. If it says soft serve ice cream, it's gotta be ice cream. But anyways, um, uh, uh, Dr. Levine, uh, you'd mentioned that this is Lab Appreciation Month, and uh, and uh, you said that the lab workers protect us. Um, um, should we like bring them a, a casserole or something to show our appreciation? Maybe a, a creamy, a maple creamy, <laughs> Steve. <laughs> and regarding honoring Dr. Uh, Dr. Fauci and calling him a, a hero. Um, hasn't uh, like he been uh, the, the contradictions and I, I know it's been a learning curve for everybody involved with this virus since the beginning but there have been so many contradictions in what he said and 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 then a, a lot of what he says if qualifiers in him like might and maybe and is could um, I just wonder you know uh, is calling him a hero and it is elevating him to some kind of sainthood. God forbid I would do that. With regard to your first comment, uh, please send cards and letters uh, expressing appreciation if that uh, urge strikes you. Uh, where's, the ad where's the address? We can get it to you. We can get it to you. Oh, great. Great, that would be great. Uh, with regard to that Fauci, I don't want him to be confused with the branches of government that have been confused, uh, that have been accused of the kind of wavering that you're talking about, you know, thinking about things like masking, where the CDC initially came out saying we shouldn't mask, later came out saying the data is now improved and we should mask. Um, Health and Human Services, you know, there are, there are actually sectors of the federal government that you could probably justly accuse of what you just did. I'm not aware that we can accuse Dr. Fauci of waffling on things or providing a misrepresentation of any specific uh, COVID-related topic. Uh, I think he's been a pretty steady hand, and um, when he's been allowed to speak, um, he's been uh, very consistent. Um, and that's that's all well, I can I, say. I do, yeah, I do remember when he came out and said that we don't need masks, and then you know later on, we were told by him that we do need masks. Um, yeah, and we need to. Anyways, we need to to be concerned on the masking issue. There was a time when we were told you don't need masks because healthcare needed the masks. Not that the masks weren't effective, but healthcare needed the masks, but we could use facial coverings and that would be fine, versus masks actually don't work and now they work. Uh, so two, two distinctions there to make. 
Okay, great. Thank you, Doctor. Sure. Um, uh, uh, Governor, uh, you mentioned uh, the, the travel rates, and, uh, and I was wondering how we've been compiling these travel rates. Is this recording data from, uh, from different businesses? Do we still have people, um, do we still have state employees uh, checking license plates? Could you tell us how the, uh, the travel rates are compiled? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I just want to make sure that we're clear on the, uh, the state employees checking license plates. Uh, it just really was about what states they were coming from. Um, so sure. there was no recording of the information. Uh, we don't do that uh, anymore. We have an automated uh, type of counting device at all the ports of entry uh, that we collect the data from uh, for some of what we do. Um, I may ask uh, Commissioner Pichek uh, to uh, because there's some other uh, methods as well uh, for collecting this data uh, that, uh, that has been uh, really fascinating in some respects. Great. Yeah, Steve, thank you for the question. So uh, that mobility data comes from a third party company that um, aggregates mobility data, so cell phone mobility data. So they aggregate it and anonymize it. Um, and it's all user consented, so the things that you download on your phone and say, you know, you can track my location. So they aggregate anonymized user consented data and they've been providing that to academic um, institutions and to um, states and municipalities and other government entities free of charge during the during the pandemic for policy implication reasons. I see. Great. Um, and one quick one for the governor, if I may. Um, governor, uh, Regarding this global warming uh, bill that you had vetoed, uh, I, I, I know that they they uh, keep saying that the transportation is the biggest, you know, um, yeah, a polluter or whatever. Uh, but r right here, I'm right I'm right on the border, and just north of us, um, like 85 percent, I believe, um, of, of Quebec heats with electricity. And then on this side of the border, it's like 85% uh, of us heat with oil. And, um, and the, uh, the, you know, like it, it, on a day when there's an inversion layer or whatever, I mean, you can smell the, you know, the, the fumes from the oil burners, even the efficient ones and everything. Um, is, and it, it, is this really settled science? I mean, I've, I've heard people, you know, uh, say that, uh, some of this climate change can be attributed to uh, uh, the Milankovitch cycles and, and, and other things. Yeah, I think the, the scientists have uh, all concluded uh, that this is, uh, you know, climate change is real and that carbon emissions uh, certainly attribute a large portion of what we're seeing today. So the sooner that we can reduce our carbon emissions, the better off we're going to be or the future generations sure. are going to be. And, and, uh, and besides so that, I mean, you think about the uh, just the, the, the pollution aspect of that, the carbon emissions and so forth. I mean, think about um, having your vehicle and putting it in a, a closed facility in your garage and leaving it running. Uh, bad things happen uh, when, when you do that. Uh, when you think, consider uh, the envelope we're in uh, throughout the world, um, we're, we're just adding uh, to the, the pollutant nature of, um, of the carbon emissions. So again, the sooner we can uh, transfer to something that's uh, carbonless, uh, the better off we're going to be. Yeah, I remember when hydrogen was all the rage, but... Well, it still is, by the way. Um, it's still, uh, there are still many uh, companies working on, on hydrogen. Uh, that could be part of the mix in the future as well. Right now, it's, it's electric vehicles, but hydrogen is still, still being worked on. All right, Steve, we're well, going to have to move. Sorry, we okay. still have three in the queue in only five minutes. Okay, I'm sorry. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh, Malia, uh, Burlington Free Press. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Okay. Um, my question is for Secretary French. I just wanted to circle back to my Donahue question regarding school sports. My colleagues and I were looking back at some of the guidance that went out prior to the school year, and we know that it says that schools have to undergo at least two weeks in step two, but at the time it seemed like it was implied that if things went well, they could start scheduling games for next week. So 
one of my first questions is just why was there a miscommunication between the state and some of the schools since many of them ended up scheduling games and started to postpone them for next week and will this rule out games that were scheduled for next weekend the 25th and the 26th yeah thanks for the opportunity to further um you know, we work very closely with VGA uh, in particular. Uh, you know, as you might be aware, the Vermont Principal Association uh, regulates youth league play. They were very involved in the development of our guidance. So, uh, you know, I, I think we were very clear all along that we were optimistic. Perhaps that's our fault of trying to convey that optimism. The conditions remain positive that we would seek to make that decision. Um, but I, I, we were unaware that folks had gone uh, as far as they had in terms of scheduling games. So that, that's no doubt part of the positive concern. Um, but I think you know, the other aspect of this is not just um, an examination of the conditions, it's also of us being comfortable that schools are uh, comfortable implementing guidance. But once again, there's other implications for the step movement that, that we have to consider beyond athletics. Uh, and I'm hopeful next week that we'll uh, be able to provide some additional clarity on how to proceed, but I can't, I can't really predict um, how that will unfold. But, um, Dr. Levine and uh, his team and our team get together early next week and hopefully uh, provide additional clarity on this. Okay, so there's there's no yes or no yet on next weekend? Uh, if we're able to provide that next week, uh, hopefully we might be able to, but at this point I don't have anything further to add to that. Okay, and then I just have one more follow-up. Um, what are some of the specific metrics that are standing in the way of schools moving into step three and where do they stand in terms of clearing those metrics yeah in terms of metrics as i mentioned uh you know certainly one thing we look at is the overall conditions in the in the broader society and i would say when we developed our guidance back in june there was consensus among our health experts that schools at that point could open in step three uh, so we decided to open in step two because we wanted to make sure that school districts would be able to implement the guidance so that's that sort of point of looking at the data, yes, uh, we can confirm uh, that we still have very high degree of infection of the virus and we're comfortable with that. So uh, it's early, you know, school just reopened, so we want to be sure. Um, but then the second aspect of uh, school districts being comfortable uh, successfully be implementing the guidance, that's the other consideration, and that's something um, I continually call superintendents and principals on. Uh, but ultimately, our, our measure, that is the metric of that, will be the public health information. So if the school districts are successful in uh, implementing guidance, we'll see, see that manifest itself in, in the broader indicators in our society. Great. Thank you so much. And you said that we're expecting some further guidance next week. Yeah, Dr. Levine's team and our team are, are going to meet uh, next week to discuss this issue, and uh, that, that basically was the, the gist of our announcement the other day that caused a lot of concern. Uh, we were just alerting people that we are starting, as, as predicted and previously conveyed, that we would start this conversation somewhere around the second week of school opening, um, and we, we basically shared that uh, with folks the other day. Um, so we'll meet again next week and review the data and uh, assess the situation and hopefully provide some clarity on this issue. Great, thank you so much. Hey Andrew, Caledonia Record. Yeah, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Governor. Um, Kingham Trails, the mountain biking network here in Eastburg, announced this week they would have to cancel an annual race uh, that was slated for next month. Um, in doing so, they cited uncertainty of the Act 50 jurisdiction on the trail systems um, and the status of the reform efforts. Uh, can you just outline your position on how you think trail systems should be governed going forward and, and your reaction to the, the reform effort as it pertains to trail systems at this point? Yeah, I mean, I think we've been quite clear. I've been quite clear over the last uh, number of years. I think that uh, the trails should be exempt from Act 250. And this was our initiative from the very start, one of the major components of Act 250 reform from my standpoint. So um, that uh, appears... Uh, at the very least, uh, to be included, although it's not permanent. Um, it, uh, it, it really just lays it out over, I believe, um, it'll be revisited in a couple of years. So it's not everything that we want, obviously, uh, but, um, but it seems to be included in the, uh, in the Senate proposal. Um, so we'll see what happens in the legislature. I just, I just can't tell you uh, whether they'll be moving forward with this or not. Uh, better question for them. Okay, thanks a lot.
Pam Davis. Uh, this is a question to the governor. Um, uh, governor, you've uh, uh, taken a very strong leadership role in this whole COVID problem, and uh, you can get credit from that from your opponent. That doesn't happen every day. Um, what I'm curious about is whether you could uh, say something at least briefly about what kind of a role, leadership role you think you need to play in the overall question of health care reform in Vermont. Um, the uh, um, that issue is not as immediate, but it is a huge, both medical and financial issue, and it is extremely complicated and controversial. So I'm curious where where you you I, I think it's fair to say that your leadership has not been as as, as been outstanding as it is as, as it has been in COVID. What do you think about that? Yeah, you know, um, I was uh, when I came into office, um, we had to make some choices about where we moved forward from the Shumlin administration. Uh, there was a, a pilot project with the all payer model. Uh, I was, uh, you know, a little apprehensive uh, about that, uh, but I decided that we needed to move forward uh, with uh, Secretary Gobey and uh, in proving ourselves, and uh, we did that uh, over. A couple of years, and it proved to be uh, effective. Uh, we have some work to do, though, with the all-payer model. It's uh, it's got some challenges. Uh, we uh, we just received a letter from uh, the HHS on this, and and uh, we need to uh, need to step up. So, again, uh, this has been an issue for us uh, over the last two or three decades, over numerous uh, administrations, um, but. Uh, but we have to, we have to provide uh, a secure, effective, efficient, uh, and affordable healthcare system. Um, and so it'll 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 remain uh, a focus for us. Uh, and uh, and Secretary Smith uh, might have some details he could elaborate on. See, if I can just get a follow-up uh, before hearing from Mike, uh, Governor. Um, this is a narrow point, but. Uh, uh, one of the major players in this whole in the whole uh, in the whole reform sphere is the Green Mountain Care Board, and one of the strongest players in the whole reform area is Jessica Holmes, one of five members of the board. Her term on the board um, uh, uh, expires uh, in 12 days. Uh, you sent a letter to. Uh, the selection committee asking them to reappoint to uh, to send to reappoint her uh, or send her name to you for reappointment. The problem is that there is a, this is a nine-member committee and there's only two members in that committee, and neither you nor the speaker of the house nor the president pro tem has filled out the committee. You don't even have a committee operating. Yet. Do you see that as a problem? Uh, I would see that as a problem, but I'm not sure that's accurate, Ham. But I'd be happy to look into it because I, I believe uh, there's enough um, uh, members for a quorum on that committee. But uh, but let me look into it because I, I just don't know. Well, I may be wrong. But we'll we'll look uh, at, we'll look into it and get back to you on that. Uh, but I would ask Secretary Smith to weigh in. Thanks, Sam. Your, um, your question is timely because I just have recently this week asked uh, my team to tr bring to me a complete plan for rebooting uh, the all-payer model and the operational aspects of the all-payer model. I've met the governor, I've mentioned to the governor that we, we need to do this. He's given me the green light to look at uh, sort of rebooting this project, the Vermont All-Payer Accountability, uh, you know, the ACO um, model agreement that we have, the Vermont All-Payer Accountable Care Organization model agreement that we have has been named as a, um, uh, as innovative in, of state-based health care reform, but that's in theory. And we, we need to be better at operationalizing uh, this model. We need to face the challenges in reality if we're going to realize the potential of a statewide payment and delivery reform system. Our health care providers are heroes, and they showed that during um, 
COVID and still show that today, but there, that doesn't mean that the system is perfect and it needs to operate on better, I think, as we move forward. We need strong partners in this effort and we need solid data and we need facilita facilitation to make the system work better for them and for Vermonters. So I would suspect you're going to see something in the next um, uh, 40 to 50 days on a plan to um, look at how we operationalize what in theory is, is been um, really lauded as something that we should achieve at, but operational, operationally we have, um, uh, we're at the midpoint now, we need to sort of change our, uh, look at our direction and make sure that we're efficient in how we're administering uh, this, um, this model. And by the way, I just want to say this, during the height of the pandemic, when we were all worried about the healthcare system, this model, the all payer model, allowed us the flexibility to move money to places where we could shore up uh, the healthcare system. So it's more than in theory, it can work. We just need to operationalize it better. Thank you. That's it. Okay, thank you very much for tuning in. We'll see you back on Tuesday.